Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, today is May 17th, and this is the Elementary School Building Committee meeting, um, our May meeting. We're now meeting once a month. Um, my first order of business is to make sure everyone on the committee can hear and be heard. And we are missing a few people. When they join us, I will uh, ask, make sure they're, they can hear and be heard as well. Uh, Jonathan. Good morning. Good morning. Jennifer. Good morning. Paul. Morning. Deb. Morning. Bruce. Good morning. Rupert. Good morning. And Alicia. Here. Thank you all for, as always, getting up bright and early for our Friday meetings. Um, this one, as you know from the agenda, is a pr pretty it's, a, it's one of those uh, key points where we're getting the 90% cost estimates and the documents have been uh, starting to be reviewed for completeness and other issues because we're heading toward bidding. Um, so I want to turn it over to Margaret, who will just review the agenda and also the schedule. Um, we've scheduled one subcommittee meeting, Margaret, so you can make sure everyone knows about that. Yeah. And then um, to continue the meeting. So, Margaret, I th you have been able screen enabling. Exactly. OK, so as Kathy said, it's a pretty brief agenda. Um, we're going to go over. Do my, I'm going to do my usual schedule overview. I'm going to talk um, a little bit about the 90 percent uh, cost estimate results. Hopefully um, everybody saw my memo um, and the the estimates, which are also posted in the packet. So good news there. Uh, talk a little bit about sustainability um, highlights, um, the Ksenia and Rick and Tim will give an update on the early site prep um, and an update on the pre-qualification process. And then we do have some invoices. So I'm gonna take that down and see if there are any questions about that. Looks like Simone has joined us. Hey, Simone. Hi, Simone. Just a double check that you can, we can hear you and you can hear us. Maybe not yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, go continue, Margaret. Okay. So I'm going to now pull up my schedule and I will tell you, this is very little changed from you know, over the last six or eight months, this has been um, sort of challenging to keep up with from month to month, but there's almost nothing different here from what you saw last time. So, you know, again, we are here in this column. So we're at the May 17th ESBC meeting. Um, we have a cost estimate reconciliation complete, and we're sort of headed into the bidding process, which is this timeline. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this um, other than to say the one thing that is not in here right now is that we do, we have scheduled the sustainability subcommittee for this coming Tuesday, the 21st, I believe is the date. So um, I'm going to actually put that in right here. <laughs> So that is really kind Margaret, of Margaret, can I just double check? I think it's the 28th. Oh, it's the 28th. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Thank you. At 11. At 11. So, so that's going to be occurring and will get posted. Um, a couple of things that are uh, good about that is we do have the um, some information, including the plug load uh, calculation back and you know, just following up on a bunch of items from the previous meetings. So um, that is it for the schedule overview. Um, does anybody have any questions about that? And Simone, can you hear us? I can hear you. Yes, I can hear. Thanks, Simone. Okay. Oh, and oh, Doug, is just, hi, Doug. Can oh, you just let us know we can hear that you're here? We can hear you. Hello, everyone. Sorry, I was late. Oh, that's okay. We're you. Actually, 
your timing is perfect. <laughs> All righty. Well, now um, I'm going to pivot to the cost estimates um, and I'm going to pull up the memo that I sent and just kind of recap it. If you haven't had a chance to read it, um, here we go. So um, the estimates came back, I guess, the end of last week, the beginning of this week, and then we met on Tuesday, I believe it was. Uh, no, it was Wednesday, all day, pretty much, um, reviewing them. Um, the news is good. So, you know, here, this is where we were at the 60% estimate. This is where we are at the 90%. This line here, this is the funding agreement with the MSBA. So the, um, and keeping in mind that this is construction value only, right? So we wanted to be at or below 81 and we're, so depending on which of these numbers we're at 79 or 78. And for the purposes of the process, we use the AM Fogarty estimate as the rec estimate of record and the PM and C estimate, which is they're working for the OPM as the check estimate. So. Um, going forward are going to be reporting on this number. So um, just to kind of put that in context of the overall budget. So um, what I'm doing here is this is the project budget column. So this is the based on the agreement that was signed with the MSBA. This is where, where we are today with the, with the Fogarty estimate. So um, as you know from the last meeting, um, you know the early site package is bid, so that's kind of reducing um, risk since we know the value of that. And you'll remember that that came in below budget. Now this is um, the Fogarty estimate number. Um, uh, keep in mind, I, this is a little bit confusing, but this number here, the 78, includes the early bid package. So. Um, you know, it's these two numbers together that add up to the Fogarty number above. So what is left to bid is the 76.6 million, let's call it 5 million. And that does include um, almost 1.5 million in design and escalation contingency. So there's still a safety factor in that number. Um, the other project costs that are embedded in the uh, project budget have not changed at this point. Um, nor have the construction contingencies that have been set a lot set aside. So essentially a way of thinking about this is that the savings that we estimate right now um, that are coming out of the bidding process, which is about 2.5 million, those essentially become additional contingency within the project. So um, I will just want to say that is all very good news. And I really want to thank um, Denisco for you know putting together a truly impressive set of documents, which is allowing for a very detailed level of estimating. Um, and with that, I'm just going to see if there are any questions about that, or Rick and Tim, if you want to add anything to what I just summarized. Rick and Tim are not first going now. That's why I say that the. the uh reconciliation process with PMNC has been very smooth all the way through and people are getting on the same page and uh, I think you can have confidence in uh, the efforts everybody had to come up with this budget. I think it's been a good process. Kathy has a question. No, it's it's actually a comment to to build on Rick's. Um, I started going through to compare the two, and a lot of key components they are so near. You know, it, you know. I know you've reconciled them too, but that also, and some of the big ticket items have that weren't design changes, such as the geothermal wells, um, the solar panels. We're getting pretty consistent numbers, so. That at least makes me feel like, you know, the inflation estimates as we're getting nearer and nearer were good and we still have an inflation factor built into these. So um, thank you all. Again, the documents were amazing uh, for the amount of detail in them. Thanks. 
Okay. Um, so we had a, the next, the next item on the agenda was highlights from the 90% documents related to sustainability. So Kathy, I believe you were hoping that Rick and Tim could uh, give some updates about the further development of those design components. Um, yeah, I, th I think that'd be great. And just the one other comment I wanted to make, I mean, I send an email to everyone on the committee. These are full, what was sent in terms of the details on the design, which are moving toward the bid were voluminous. Um, and there is a paper copy at, at town hall somewhere, Paul. I mean, Bob Parent told me there is one. If people want to look at the full extent of it, we're we're making an attempt to condense a few of the files to be able to post them somewhere, but they weren't they weren't downloadable and postable. And then for the entire set, there were some cons there are concerns of security on telling folks exactly where everything is in the building. Um, so at this point, we weren't they're too big to post anyway, but they weren't. Um, being broadly shared. And Margaret, you you might just say a word about how many eyes are looking at these documents um, in addition to you and Danisco and... <laughs> well, and, and Bruce uh, and Coldham, who I want to give a big shout out to for having dug into the detail in the last week and um, uh, forwarded some questions, which uh, the, the Danisco team has responded to. So um, yeah, so let me kind of iterate that. So we're looking at the documents. Um, Shelley and Jacob um, are looking at the documents from uh, the net peer review perspective. Um, the commissioning agents are reviewing the documents. There is a structural engineer, what's called a peer review, uh, peer structural review, which is ongoing, which will get submitted with the 90% set. Um, that feature that used to be a part of the Massachusetts building code. It is no longer part of the code, but the MSBA requires it. And I think it's actually a good thing, particularly for um, folks in building departments in towns like Amherst to, you know, get um, some reassurance that an, a second structural engineer has looked at the structural design. Um, the MSBA will reviewing be reviewing the documents. Um, and honestly, you know, I think um, I want to say that we got, we got some great comments um, from the estimators who, in as they dug into the detail of the estimate, identified some items which um, were will be better for clarifications made in their wake. So Rick and Tim and Ksenia, am I thinking of anybody else who's looking at this that I've left out? Well, Bob Parents expressed an interest in digging into the civil drawings, and he'll be giving us our uh, comments by the 1st of June, and, and then we'll take those and we'll schedule a time with Guilford to go back over everything uh, thereafter. Uh, it's more of a regulatory review, but as a result of finishing up the drawings, there were adjustments in the storm drainage. So we submitted to CONCOM for a de minimis change on that. So that's on Aaron's desk now being reviewed. I think that's about it. Do you want to make any comments on the development of the sustainability design? So the geothermal, the solar, et cetera? Um, we can just say that obviously throughout the process, there have been back and forths, uh, you know, balancing the issues of cost, whether or not we were going to meet the code required energy model, stuff like that. So if you'll remember, we've had double pane, triple pane, more insulation, less insulation, insulation under the building uh, continuously or two feet at the perimeter. Um, the 90% set that has been issued. Um, reflects you know the final resolution of all of those items and none of them are up in the air and we even have the actual date that the 10th edition of the massachusetts state building code will go into effect now um <laughs> which is we are we are going to be in the concurrency period when this uh, actually goes out to bid but all of those uh items 
have been resolved uh, finally uh, before we go out to bid and they are reflected in the set. Um, even the additional uh, plug load model that we will review in detail with the subcommittee is back and it has us basically on target for where uh, we had been all along. So right. and the, the, the energy model is, is being revisited and with the detail of the, of the new code, it means that Thornton Tomasetti is tearing into any construction details that might have changed because basically there's no detail too small now for the energy model to, to make sure that um, the heat losses and gains are consistent with what we're trying to hit. Okay. Any questions? I see a Bruce question. Uh, more of a comment than a question. I uh, just from the committee's point of view, I can say that I agree with Margaret's uh, view that this is an extraordinarily comprehensive and and competent set of documentation, and and one that I I looked at uh, basically the exterior envelope section. So I read the spec sections through the divisions five uh, four, which is masonry through. Division eight, which is windows. Uh, I mean, one reads these things uh, quickly and not every word, but tries to get all the important uh, sections. And then I looked at all of the drawings in the wall sections and the construction details, which in my day would have accounted for maybe <coughs> five or 10 drawings, but in this case, it's uh, 20 or 30. Um, it's such a, a, a comprehensive coverage here. And uh, I, I did look at other sections as well, but that was where I spent most of my time. I had uh, many questions, many of which I answered as I went along, but I ended up sending about 40 to Denisco through Kathy. Uh, and every one of them except one was satisfactorily answered. And I should say that the unsatisfactory answer is not only unsatisfactory to me, but it's also unsatisfactory to Rick. But it's a, it's a kind of what can you do kind of situation with uh, manufacturers' um, requirements and so forth. But uh, a short uh, um, comment is that uh, I've never seen such a comprehensive set of documents in the 50 years that I've been operating. And that includes uh, the ones that my office prepared, and I used to be pretty proud of what we did. So uh, we can, I think, on basis of what I've seen, be very confident that um, uh, the, the documentation set is essentially a record of what we own before it's built. And all of the cons uh, the discussions and arguments that happen during construction are about whether or not these documents satisfactorily describe what we own before we actually own it. And this is a pretty comprehensive description of what we own. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. I see Jonathan has his hand up. On my own mute. Uh, I, I didn't go to Bruce's extent and read read all those spec sections, um, but I can say from from my review, I absolutely agree with with Bruce. This is an incredibly comprehensive set of drawings. Um, you know, it, it it's quite professional. I'm I'm very pleased with where we are, and like Bruce, I'm very happy that you know it, it's well documenting what the town uh, wants and and will ultimately own through the project. Right. Thank you. I am not seeing any other hands. Kathy. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Kathy. <laughs> Kathy. So, so what I just want, Angelica's joined us and I just want to make sure we can hear her, but she also, there's a UMass graduation going on. So she let me know that she may not be able to stay. Angelica. Good morning, you... everyone. And yes, sorry, this is weekend, big weekend for UMass. So starting last night till Sunday, you will see a lot of traffic closures. So heads up on that. <laughs> so I, I had um, a couple, I had some questions, not, not so much on what was in the cost estimates, but uh, um, on if we, when I went back to look at uh, what we did in January 2023, when we were value engineering, when we were cutting cutting some items um, that were 
in the initial design to see whether, and this is a question on whether we could think of those as potential alternatives if when we go out to bid, since I don't want to add to costs, I think it's a good news that we're under the cost es estimates um, under the budget. But I'll, I'll give you the couple, the three examples that I found. One was the uh, the backstops for the softball fields. Um, they were in the $60,000 range for two or 65 if it was rolled up. And my understanding is that we, you know, if, if we put them in, we would get a bid on the cost of those. So I don't know, I'm not suggesting we put it in, but have it in an alternative. Rick and, Rick and Tim can tell me how one might do it. So that was one. Then we reduced the um, tiling in the bathrooms, as I can read our it was, you may or may not remember what this spreadsheet looked like. It was tiny little numbers, but but we the bathroom tiling was reduced to leave part of it to, that would need to be painted. And that was uh, uh, almost 100,000, 94,000 estimate savings. And the notes on that, what I was looking for is notes where it said it's ex basically the same. It said, somewhat less durable will require painting and maintenance. And then similarly, the the tiling in the hallways was reduced. So uh, those were three areas. And I didn't know whether Rick and Tim might want to comment on the tiling issues. Those were the three I saw. Most of the others made a lot of sense to me that we hadn't cut anything. There were no, I was looking for wording like not as durable or less durable or requires maintenance, not a complete replacement that gave us the same aesthetic. Um, so those were the three I had. Um, so Margaret, I don't know, I'll just- Yeah, Rick and Tim, why don't you respond to that? And uh, then I see Bruce has a comment question as well. As well. Okay. Uh, well, it, Kathy, you're putting this as doing them as, as bidding uh, alternates to add in instead of incorporating them now. And, uh, just from a procedural uh, standpoint, as Ksenia and Margaret can elaborate, the bid laws require the awarding authority to accept bids in order. So you can't, if you get bids for alternates on three items, you have to take the first one and to get to the third one, you have to take the second one and to get to the third one, you have to take them in order. So that's one thing. Uh, on a project this size, I wouldn't recommend doing the backstops as an alternate. It's a very small number. The other, the other unfortunate thing about alternates is it's something else to put in a bid form. And I like to keep bids clean and it's an opportunity for somebody to make a mistake. And it's kind of a small thing to make a mistake on uh, and jeopardize a bid. So my personal recommendation for the backstops was either put them in or keep them out. Unfortunately, there's no middle ground. There's been some discussion about can we do the foundations and then come back later, you know, so we don't have to auger holes in the dirt and put the the posts in. But the uh, the backstop pipes are typically uh, poured with the foundations and not put in a sleeve. So there's a structural and a coordination effort there. So I really, that's my position on that. As far as the uh, the tiling, you know, Tim can, uh, of all the, the VE items, that's probably the only thing, if you had said, what would you put back in? It would be uh, some of the tile. And I think Tim, also uh, we've got a Wayne's cot on one wall of the stairs that was included in that VE. So that's that's maybe the one item. It's also a, a real easy item to put in the drawings now. If you went back on some of these things, you'd have a bunch of architects jumping off the bridge because we've got six weeks to go and we're kind of down the road. 
That's it. You know, and so I, I raised those, Rick, only because I saw the notes that you had put in on tile. Mm -hmm. um, it we were giving up something by yes, using yeah. it. So 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 not alternatives then. So I'll, those are the three I saw. So I'm understanding that you would just put them in the drawings. You know, you would put them in for the bidders. Yeah, I if, think if we did it. That's the way we do it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I, I just want to add, I would concur with, with Rick's opinion on that. Bruce, do you want to add something to this conversation? Um, only to say, to add to Kathy's list, I looked at the same list that you did, Kathy, last night. Uh, and uh, the other downgrades were replacing granite curbs, I think, with bituminous curbs, I think unit pavers with uh, either concrete. Uh, so, so some of those landscaping downgrades, but... These are, again, as you were, their questions, because uh, I really hear what Rick said, that you don't want to uh, of course people to have their heads spinning sideways, because when you have a set of drawings that are as comprehensive as this, that's great. But when you have a set of comprehensive drawings and you want to make changes at the last minute, you've got a comprehensive set of drawings to change. And so I would be guided by Denisco's sense on what what is uh, advisable here. But I simply add those as... Uh, uh, items that I saw on the list that if you could wave a wand, you might choose to uh, uh, put them back in or not. And whether you put them back in and is into the drawings themselves or as alternates, uh, again, I'm I'm uh, not, not uh, I don't have enough experience to know the the wisdom and so forth. Other than to say, I mean, uh, the uh, the notion of an alternate is that you are capturing the the competitive uh, pricing. Uh, as opposed to doing it subsequently where you're in a change order situation, unless, of course, you do it after the contract is completed, in which case it's a whole other um, piece of work. So there are three ways in which you can do it, as opposed to doing nothing at all. So that's four, I suppose. And uh, uh, which of those four is the way, way to handle these uh, borderline items from January last year, where we were saying, yes, we wanted them, but no, we can't afford them, or we don't know we can afford them. Let's be safe. Uh, but uh, so there's there's not many of them, but there's those three of Kathy's and two of mine potentially that we might choose to be interested in. Visenya, I see your hand, but I'm going to go to Jonathan and Paul first. Okay, so Jonathan, I you know I would argue that um, to avoid alternates, if 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 we can, just from the same perspective that Rick's coming from, keep keep that bidding set as clean as possible. Um, the less opportunity for mistakes, the less opportunity for confusion. Um, you know, when you know, if, if we were in a financial position where we we were really feeling like we were missing something critical, um, and the only way we could, you know, get the potential of it was to include it as an alternate, I would be more supportive. Um, I, I tend to agree. You know, at, at, if the items are small and we want to reconsider adding them back in, uh, we should do that. But I, I would caution against, um, you know, making the bidding process any more complicated than it needs to be. Okay, Paul. Uh, yeah, so I agree with the. Uh, I understand the um, goal of simplicity and clarity for the bidders. And you know, again, we have a fair, very recent experience with this with another project where it was compl more complicated and um, resulted in um, a very high bid. My concern is that if we incorporate things that weren't part of our original goal of building a new school and the bid prices come above, you know, we, we had a confidence at 90% level, you know, in December for this other project. And so, and then suddenly it comes in, not suddenly it comes in much higher. Um, I don't know if, uh, I don't think that's gonna happen with this project, but I, we have, you know, we have been hit by this before. So I, my goal is to keep this project within budget. And as we start to add things into the budget, have we had a, are these the things we want to add? Have we had a coherent conversation about including these particular things in the original budget? I don't think it's too hard for bidders to handle one or two, um, you know, alternates, you know, especially if they're standalone alter alternates. Um, but I just want to make sure that if we're going to add things in, these are the things that this committee really wants to add in as our priorities. 
um, because I worry about the project coming in higher than we had originally anticipated. And then we're, you know, then, and I guess the assumption is that these would be the first things that would be value engineered out. Mm. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's go to Ksenia and then to Alicia. Thank you. So I also want to agree that keeping documents, bid documents as clean as possible is ideal. I've heard many philosophies on the use of alternates, and I think I think the one that strikes the most true with me is that an alternate is often a great thing for if a project is coming in over budget and you have one meaningful thing that you can drop so that you don't have to restart the process. I don't think we're in significant risk of that. Um, so, and I, I agree with Paul that one or two well-structured, ideally only one well-structured and very standalone alternate is a good idea. I also agree um, with Rick that the value of a backstops relative to the value of a project is something that we should probably just work that into the base scope, especially given the current estimates. Um, the reconciliation, the estimate reconciliation meeting had some absolutely amazing to me uh, discussion of the fact that both estimators right now, estimators are very conservative people, um, concur that it's time to start recognizing some good news from the market trends as part of the estimate. Um, so it sounds like not only has have some things trended in a better direction than we've seen in the last few years, but not only that, but estimators who are conservative are ready to recognize that. And that's excellent news. Having said that, I just want to say it is not in any way a bad thing to be progressing into the rest of this project and into the bidding process and even past the bidding process with a very healthy contingency because there are a lot of innovative technologies included in this project. And there may be things that come up around the use of innovative technologies, you know, and the, the sustainable things, the geothermal, the solar, you know, um, some innovative um, HVAC equipment that would benefit from having had a safe cushion. Thank you, Kasanya. Alicia. Um, thank you. So I, I understand like not wanting to overcomplicate the documents so that when we go out to bid, we have more of a chance of getting like a wide range of good bids. Um, but I don't think that like smaller items like the backstop would put us at risk of not getting the bids that we're looking to get at this point. And I think like with the 90% estimates, like I do feel very confident in this project and that we're moving in the right direction regardless. And so I'm hoping that we can just have that discussion now as to whether or not we can add that back in. Um, since, you know, I think Paul said he would like to have a discussion about it. And so I'm wondering when we can have that discussion. I would suggest we have it now. Um, Paul, just, I went back, you know, it, to the the design, it had it had a big one and a side one, and the total cost was in the sixty five thousand dollar range in for two different pieces. Um, so that's why I I focus on it because my understanding was well we'll have to put the field and then we'll have to dig it up to put the backstop in when we do it. Um, and if it's part of a bigger package, we might get a better price on it rather than trying to just mm -hmm. go out and buy it with the labor costs, because they're going to be concrete people out there doing something with curbs. So that th that's where I started. I just saw the tiling completely because it said more labor costs, more maintenance costs, so that we're lowering the price tag. So it wasn't an urgent. We all thought that was fine. But the backstop was relatively inexpensive. Paul Sanders, you, Paul, you can speak. Yeah. Yeah. Is, so thank you. So yeah, I, I, I'm not saying I, I totally understand the econ the economics of that and and agree with it. Um, my only, I want to make sure that this. I know with this group that we are saying we're choosing this over something else. 
you know, and what is this a choice of something? Are we saying no to something? Not even even either or. Are there is there something else we should be considering since we have confidence enough to put the backstop in? Is there something else that we should be adding at this point in time as well? And I'll just you know, when I looked at the just in that context, this mm -hmm. the tiling. I mean, Rick, Rick and Tim are the ones who know about tiling, and then Rupert who has to maintain buildings. Uh, the reducing the tiling wainscoting saved us 55,000. So it's comp when you're saying it's comparable to the backstop costs, you know, on uh, right. is something else. That was what caught my uh, eye. The bathroom was more expensive. It would be 95 that, and this is, we're dealing with the year old numbers, but they had yeah. an inflation factor in them. So I didn't know those just had caveats on them. It's the only mm -hmm. reason I Everything else said just as durable will work just as well. So it wasn't uh, we were giving up something. Um, I actually it's a tiny savings, but I there is a specification for goldenrod and in the plants. It's not very much money, but I'm a person that sneezes when she goes around the goldenrod. <laughs> So I would just, I would just look, look at the shrubs we're putting in and not add add to the sneezing. And someone said to me, "We're going to get goldenrod on the this lot, whether we want it or not, because it is." We're talking about a couple it's the that's making it, you sneeze, not the goldenrod. <laughs> so no, if I, I mean, I, I want, a couple of thousand dollars. Yeah, if yeah. I can reframe, I, I guess what I'm thinking is. We're going to have to do the backstop at some point in time. I totally agree with that. And whether it comes out of this or CPA, whatever. But um, my the way I understand the town approved this building, and I would put the money, the first dollar into the building, if it makes the building better, that's what the voters approve. That's what my goal on the building committee is to make the building um, a, as good a building as we possibly can within the, the um, costs that we, you know, the budget that we have. And so again, that's that's how I look at it. Is that the money goes into the building, and then and then the other parts of the project as well. I see Alicia's hand is up again. Um, thank you. Yeah, no, I I totally hear where Paul is coming from with the concern, but I also think like looking at it a little more holistically, uh, some of the things that came out of the community listening sessions were about like usability for the community and having more versatile use of the fields and outdoor options. And like, you know, we do have a whole subcommittee of like we're looking at the playground in the outside area. So that is also an important aspect of the project outside of the building and how usable and versatile the fields and what we put outside of the building are for both the students and for the community members. Um, and I think if we're already designing it in mind for it to be used for athletic purposes, it just makes sense to put the backstop back in, um, especially considering, like Kathy said, it's not a big ticket item. Um, and I think that just doing it up front when we have the contingency space and it's not going to be taking up much of that, um, it's like a very small cost. I think we should seriously consider just adding it back in so that it can be usable for those athletic purposes as soon as it's ready to go. Bruce. Well, let's say in order to move this conversation forward, I move that this committee uh, instruct the design team to restore the backstop uh, to the uh, construction documentation. I second the motion, but that doesn't end discussion if anyone else wants to weigh in. It, it, the point is it starts discussion on a, yeah, yeah. In, a in the right direction. Right. Deb. Hi. Um, so as someone very inexperienced in this kind of thing, and all I know is the project that uh, uh, Paul is referring to, if for some reason the bids come back with the backstop in as uncomfortably close to the maximum, what is the process for addressing that at that stage? So, so you're asking if if we blow through our contingencies yeah. and, and a sixty five a sixty seven thousand dollar cut would make the difference. Can we I then just no no because I think that's yeah. we then, can we then make a cut? You know, can yeah. we Easily. So, 
Um, I I have no idea. <laughs> you know. Uh, well, I mean, the the nugget of it would be, I mean, this is this is the the issue that risk is that Rick is raising about the alternate. So, the easy way to take it out is to put it in as an alternate, because then you it's what's called an ad alternate. You can choose to accept it or you can leave it out. But you know, to Rick's point, he would prefer that the documents be simpler. So, if you go with um, doing it as an alternate, there is no risk on that. If you go with the using, having an alternate with a separate bid item, you probably pay a little bit more for it and there is a little bit of risk, so. Thank you. Ksenia? Deb, when you talk about the contingencies being depleted and therefore do we have the option of dropping it, do you mean at bid time or do you mean ultimately as we go through construction? Because there are different sets of contingencies um, right, so there's going to be um, with each step, major step that we take along this process, um, we reduce the scope of risk, right? So bidding is a major one. When we get past that, there's still risk of changes, you know, unforeseen conditions in construction and there are contingencies for that. Um, I could say that change orders can go both directions. Right. So if we know that this is something we're worried about and if we're waiting to get past the geothermal work or some other, you know, what we might deem a risky venture, um, we could hold on having the backstops ordered. Right. So that we still have the option of backing it out as a change order. Given the scope of a project and the value of the backstops, I doubt it will A, be necessary and B, if, if we're in that situation, be the, the heal all solution, if things got that dire, but there are still mechanisms to remove scope later on as we go on. Yeah, and I mean, just to be clear that what Ksenia is talking about is this line item, if you can see the screen. So this construction contingency, this is the line item in the budget for change orders. So as she says, the, the third way to do this is to treat it as a change order during construction and then it would come out of this value. And her, her point is you could choose to do it later in the project um, because it's, it's part of the final site work so that you know where you stand relative to other change orders. So Paul, you had a question or a comment? Uh, yeah, so yeah, I don't support that approach that we put it in the change order. I think that's not a wise approach. Um, to, Two things, just from the and the what the design team is saying is we recommend that you include this into the original budget. Are and then my question to the design team: Are there any other things that you think we should be adding into the into this original bid document so that we have fewer addendum as we go through this? That's question one. Uh, uh, and maybe I'll leave it there and then go to my second question once that question gets answered. Uh, I think the addendum is. Uh... A separate item that we can talk about that I don't see if you've got alternates, they cause addenda. Uh, Tim, can you think of anything uh, other than the tile that given the parameters that the committee has talked about as, as, as being a, a qualitative issue uh, that might be considered? Honestly, no. I mean, we. I would like to think that we've spent a lot of time making sure that the value engineering items that we did select would not have a qualitative or experiential impact on the project. We certainly saved a lot of money in the exterior envelope and some design features, and there's always a nicer finish than the one you could select. But I don't think putting any of that money back into the project is going to meaningfully improve the building, and I don't see a need to do it. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the second question is more a comment Ksenia said earlier. So Ksenia, what you said is that the design estimators are starting to incorporate sort of positive news, I think you said, into their design estimates. And this is a this is designed based on multiple bids happening later this year, basically. Um, and is that something new that you're seeing um, from design estimators that's, yes. they're starting to, so- 
I haven't heard that from anyone in the last many years. It's very exciting, but also estimators are incredibly good th at what they do. They do not possess a crystal ball that's functional. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's useful. Thank you. So, but them being conservative, that's why it took them so many years to even start saying that and mm -hmm. using those numbers. So, okay. I see Rupert's hand is up. Thank you. Um, I know that this is a discussion uh, on a motion for the backstop. Um, and um, I think I, I think it's clear that the town is going to end up spending the money on the backstop and it's probably the least expensive way to do it is to do it as part of this project. Um, uh, if we wanted to discuss, you know, other possible improvements, um, I, I, I would like to learn a little bit more about Bruce's suggestion regarding uh, the curbing, going back to granite, because um, I do feel like that's something that uh, with plow trucks and, and mowers uh, may not stand the uh, test of time as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would sort of like some input from folks who deal with this stuff more. Uh, and in, if we were going to talk about tile and wanted to prioritize it, I think stairwells and bathrooms would be uh, much more uh, valuable in terms of reducing maintenance uh, than just the hallway wing cutting tile. Uh, those are my comments. Thank you. Jonathan? Were people able to hear? I had a hard time hearing Rupert, but I think I got the gist of it. Yeah, I mean, he's uh, his points were that he's echoing Bruce Coldham on the looking back to the granite curbs as opposed to, I think what we have is Cape, Cape Cod berms, which is formed asphalt curbs. And then um, he was saying that from his perspective, the tile in the bath, uh, higher tile in the bathrooms and stair hall, and and uh, stair halls was more important than the than the okay. quarters. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, I'm just really sorry. I was making sure it was something you did. Um, I, I'm supportive of the idea of, of of you know putting the backstops back in the in the in the base project, um, and it would be open to discussing some of the other things. But but that one seems like a simple one to me. Um, and then just a quick comment uh, on the note, you know, on the topic of of estimates, the other thing to remember about um, you know estimates at this level is that the estimators are not trying to identify the low bidder for a project; they're trying to be middle of the pack. You know that gets to that conservatism, um, and so uh, I'm I'm feeling mildly optimistic about where we are cost wise. Okay, so. Uh, we had a motion about the backstop. Um, do you want to take a vote on the backstop or is there any desire to expand the motion to include more scope like the tile or in the, let's just limit it to Rupert's point, the, the bathrooms and stair halls and then the third one, which is is a bigger ticket item than the other. It's a much bigger ticket item. Yeah, Kathy, what I January thirteenth packet. January thirteenth. Okay, great. I will. I will. 20, 2023. But that yeah. was more in the couple hundred thousand dollar range. If I, I wrote, I wrote notes to myself. I mean, that was, and I think Rick and Tim, you were saying that is go back to the architect design stuff as opposed to tiles were easy. So I, I don't know, it, it was just more cost, a lot more costly. So this is the um, concrete paving. That's not the, yeah, that, yeah, you, you don't have the one that has the what we took in it, right? It's in. Yeah, we we took a couple different curbing items. We we took um, at the drive lanes the Cape Cod berm, as Margaret mentioned. We took a switch to precast curb around the play area, um, and and it is well over a hundred thousand dollars for the multiple items.
Yeah, I don't actually see the K-Pod per minute, but I think Tim's got his handle on the number for the the granite. I mean, I I'm with Rupert on the on the granite, but now we're starting to talk about you know real dollars. I see Rupert's hand is up again, and then Bruce. So Rupert, why don't you go? Okay, I'm trying to hold my microphone in my hand and speak a little bit louder. It's better. Okay. That's better. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I think that we should just vote on the backstop and then continue the discussion separately so we don't get too muddled. Well, I I mean, I, yeah, let's do that. Okay. Uh, Bruce, do you want to add anything before we, we take uh, that vote? Only to say I agree. I was going to suggest we do them as three separate votes, uh, the backstop and then tiling and then curving. And we can vote separately in each one if we choose. And we could even instruct differently as to whether. And and, and I think obviously with the uh, uh, granite, we would need to hear uh, from uh, Denisco about just how disruptive it is to their process. So I, I think yeah. I think that each of the three of those items is different and we should vote and consider and vote separately. OK, so is there Ksenia? Yes, um, thank you. There's also an option to vote for something potentially to be carried as an alternate. I think we should clarify which what which way we're proposing to vote on each of them. Like okay. maybe the more expensive one for curbing would be the one meaningful alternate. So Bruce was proposing to include it. That was mm -hmm. the basis of the vote, not as an alternate. Mm -hmm. So any other discussion before we take a vote? I, oh. Yeah, I do. I'm sorry, I raised my hand. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> so, so I just want to be clear how I intend to vote. I I, I intend to vote for the the curbing and the tile, um, and I would vote the backstop as a third priority. So I, I'm just so you know how I'm looking at this in terms of, I think they're all good things to add, and if we're feeling confident in our numbers, why not add all three? Uh, okay, so from a process perspective, um, I think we need to have three separate votes. Mm -hmm. And then um, I think we would have to have a third vote <laughs> on assuming that they all passed, um, they would they would all go in, but the vote will determine, the majority vote will determine whether they are all in or not. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And Paul, um, are you okay with us taking them in the order that they've been raised, which is backstop, tile, um, granite? Because I do agree with Bruce Coldham that we need to hear. I think the impacts, the backstop and the tile impacts on the design team are fairly small. And then I do want to hear from Tim and Rick on whether if we went to granite curves, that is an impact on your process. Alicia, sure. you have a question? Yeah, I just, I don't necessarily think we have to determine the order now. I think we have a motion on the floor and we can just vote on that motion. And then if someone wants to make another motion for whichever they feel like should come next, that we can do that one next. Yep. Um, but I think we have a motion on the floor and I would like to vote. Okay. Ksenia? Should we clarify when we say tile where we mean? Because we talked about bathrooms. We will we, we will about... clarify that when we get to the tile. Okay. Okay. So the motion on the floor, Bruce um, motioned, Kathy seconded, is whether to incorporate the backstop as it has been previously proposed into the base documents for the project. And uh, I'll I'll do the member call if Margaret oh. can take the tally. Um, so going across, Bruce? Aye. Paul? Yes. Doug? Yes. Jonathan? This is back. Jonathan? Yes. Can you hear Deb, me? Deb oh. Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Rupert? Yes. 
Simone? Yes. Angelica? Yes. Elisha? Yes. It's unanimous with three absent. Okay. So um, someone want to take up the tile? Oh, Paul's got a question. So I move to include the granite curbing into the uh, baked bid packet package. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Deb second. Okay. So um, can I ask, yes, Rick, can you and Tim talk about the impact on the construction document process sure. and your opinion about this. Well, on, on one hand, anything that you add on site work doesn't affect Tim and I at all because I'm going to tell Brown Sedina and Corsley Witten to do it. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of a smart answer. But uh, there's a couple of there's a couple of components to the curbing, and I'm going to ask Tim because I don't have a drawing in front of me. We still have granite curbing on the project. We have granite curbing where it abuts sidewalk. We eliminated granite curbing where it would, uh, something else would do. We have Cape Cod berm along the planted edge of the parking lot. Uh, and I am not sure I'm going to, some of that's a component of the of the storm drainage, uh, so I I'm going to say right now that I'd have to ask if that affects the storm drainage. I'm going to guess that it it doesn't because it's a a vertical edge as opposed to a a, a tapered Cape Cod berm. Uh, the other uh, uses as as Tim mentioned, we we substituted precast around playground elements that were flush granite before. Tim, can you uh, offer your recollection of what where those changes would be too? Do we still have a-, a um, I, I'm looking at drawings and, and we actually took the e items at 60% and at DD related to curbing. And as, uh, you know, as Rick is starting to describe, we have multiple curb conditions spread throughout the project. So in the space of this conversation, it's going to be very hard to nail down a number and a quantity and an exact, um, or shall I say, a pre precise change to vote on. Um, but, but we do have granite curbs where you have sidewalk in the project. We did accept a substitute to go to precast around the play area. We do have at the, um, along the drive aisles, we have the Cape Cod berm, and then we have at the uphill side of the parking lot on the west, we don't have a curb. So there, there is a a full menu of curbs that we have on the project. Um, and and replacing them, you know, like from a precast to a granite is not a large um, imposition on the design team. Uh, and I'm speaking for someone that's not present, but uh, I, I can say that we have no confidence. Uh, we have uh, no problem asking them to do that. But um, that, that's a sort of long-winded answer to say, to give you a, a fully informed, fully detailed um, description of cost and what you would be voting on or an estimate of the cost and what you would be voting on might might be uh, impossible in, in this meeting. Yeah, um, I, I just pulled up, this is a, just a random picture from the internet, just in case anyone doesn't know what a Cape Cod berm is. So it's an asphalt formed berm. And as um, Rick and Tim say, it's it's not everywhere, but it's in some locations. So I see, uh, Rick, you still have your hand up. Did you wanna, no, hand is down. Okay, Rupert and Kathy. Rupert, why don't you go next? Uh, so I'd like to clarify maybe um, my interest in replacing with granite is really only where the Cape Cod berm is subject to damage from plow trucks. I think that's really the only place that uh, is worth trying to um, incorporate a hard, hardier substance. Uh, other folks may have more experience with plowing than I do. I've never run a plow truck, but um, I don't think precast around the playground is of major concern in terms of maintenance. Uh, it's really just the snow plows. And I would say yeah. that's exactly what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> My Thank motion. You. 
Thank you for the clarification. Now that's helpful, folks. Kathy? Um, you know, this was one that I didn't raise when I first raised them because I thought it was more work on the design team, Paul and Rupert. Um, and so I don't know whether there's what Rupert just said is the specific areas where the plow trucks are. We do have that Cape Cod berm all over the town. I've been looking looking at it and including on the UMass parking lots. Only some of them have the sturdier stuff. So I I would I hate I was trying to avoid adding complications when I brought, I was doing this. So um, I could probably vote against this unless the design team tells me they think this isn't essential and they didn't think it was essential when we took it out. So that was a, a comment as well as an observation about having learned what these things are, my eyes keep saying, what does Amherst College have? What does UMass have? And how many variations are there? Yes, many. Rick? You want to the, add something? Uh, yeah, the, the picture you put up is a Cape Cod berm. I think it's it's actually more abrupt than the one that we've got detailed. Yeah. Uh, and of of the revisions, uh, Tim, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but simply switching out the snowplow related curb elements should not be an imposition on the site design team. Uh, yeah, I think that would be accurate. And then I think, well, you know, the areas where it would be of greatest concern, for example, the uh, loop in the drop off loop south of the building where the plow is required to make turns, uh, possibly snow can't see that those islands in the center are Cape Cod burn. Uh, a concrete curb there would certainly be more um, durable and will survive. Uh, excuse me, granite. Yeah. There are a lot of curbing uh, details on the table right now. A granite curb there would survive uh, an occasional impact with a plow, whereas a Cape Cod berm would not. Deb Leonard? Uh, so would Paul entertain a friendly amendment to include the uh, granite along the areas that are affected by plowing and not the playground? Yes, yes. And I would just, I don't even think that's, an, I think that's a clarification on the motion okay. to, to be in in sync with what Rupert had identified as the, as the high priority items. So, sorry, Paul mentioned, who was the second? It was Deb. That so was I don't see any other hands. Are you all ready to take a vote on this? I am not seeing any no's. So Kathy, do you want to call the roll or would you like me to do that? Oh, Rupert's hand. Rupert's hand is up, Rupert's hand is down. Rupert's hand is up. <laughs> sure. So I just I just want to make sure before folks vote that we don't actually have a uh, an estimated number that we're adding, but we think that it's uh, less than two hundred thousand because that was the sum of all of the value engineering for curbs. Is that correct? That's correct. I would say it's substantially more than that. You're, it's substantially more than 200,000? No, less. It's substantially less, less than that. Okay. And it, just, uh, I'm sorry, I should raise my hand, not just take a chair, but um, to the extent the number is higher than we think, um, can we, uh, this is what makes me uncomfortable about voting on this one, Paul, because I know the other ones are not very expensive. Um, can we, get a number you've got to put this in the drawing so I, I we don't have time to futz around with this so we're telling you to put it in the drawing and then this could be one if the bids come in higher than we hope is on a list for s switching back I mean the good thing about the parking lot is it happens after the school you know it's not right on day one so I'm just looking for if if we need to switch it back but if it's in the hundred thousand or less range, it's it's a smaller number. But I just don't have a sense of the number. Rupert, his hand is up. I Rupert. guess my other question for uh, um, for folks who deal with this stuff all the time is that the kind of thing that you would uh, consider as an ad alternate because it is relatively simple 
uh, change. Uh, and since that is not part of Paul's uh, original motion, uh, should we vote on uh, if it should pass, whether it would be add alternate or incorporated, or can we decide that after? Process question. So if I can address that, so you would make an amendment to the motion if you wanted to make it an ad alternate. Um, my motion is to include it in the in the base bid. All right, so I guess I'd like to hear back from uh, the construction experts about that notion before I make such a uh, an amendment. We're not trying to complicate your lives. We are though, I know. <laughs> Uh, it's, it would be a relatively easy add alternate. Uh, it affects, it affects one trade, one bidder and it's GC work. Uh, so diagrammatically and by detail, it could be done pretty simply. Again, it's we're talking about in the order of magnitude of about a hundred thousand dollars, I guess, from somebody that's seen the list. Uh, it could be done that way. Uh, Bruce has his hand up, and Kasanya, Bruce. Um, I think we should vote on this as uh, as Paul has uh, moved uh, for it to be added to the base. The concern that we have that uh, unique among the three options we're considering, we haven't uh, really got a, 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 a firm idea of price on this. I think we should adjust that by saying we will um, decide subsequently whether we might uh, revise that to uh, instruct it as an, as an alternate as opposed to being part of the base. That way the work is done. Uh, it's in the drawings, and then uh, it, it could be rephrased slightly differently or, or, or to become an alternate if we choose to. But I think we can proceed to put it in um, and with with uh, you know with with with, with uh, in, in good conscience because we could decide to uh, declare it or instruct its de declaration as an alternate subsequently on advice of the design team. Ksenia? I think this might actually fit the philosophy of carrying a single deduct alternate that if you're in trouble, you drop it. But then the base scope would be nicely packaged. And if we just want to move forward without that alteration, we just don't execute the deduct alternate. And there's no additional uh, document modification and, um, that's needed in order to incorporate an add alternate. Jonathan? I'm supportive of Consenia's approach. Um, you know, we're getting close to the end of the process here. Um, I would, would prefer not to be instructing the design team at our next meeting to do something um, in the way of, of uh, putting something as an alternate or including as a base, but I'd rather give them clear instruction today. I think Consenia's approach does that. Okay, so I'm not seeing any hands. So I think the Paul, we would be modifying your proposal to include the additional granite curbing where it could where curbing could be impacted by the plow as a deduct alternate and the scope. That's that's not that, my motion. Oh, okay. Sorry, you want to my motion my motion is to include it in the base bid. Included in the base bit. Period. Yep. Okay. Does someone want to make a modification to that be as a deduct alternate? Can, can I can I ask? Do we need to say that right now, or mm. can the team just do it? I, you know, in other words, we put it in the base, and it becomes one of the things that we can do. I I don't quite understand how the the bidding works on this. I'm I'm a neophyte on this, first time ever. Paul, oh. and, and here's why. I mean, this is why we're getting confused here. Is that we're doing we're we want to put this in as it's a hundred thousand dollars versus the previous thing we just voted without a question as a deduct alternate, and if we we're talking about which ones are deduct alternates, I'm choosing the base the thing that 
our, yeah. our facilities director says we need. And I, would, I, would, I don't want to get into that conversation. And I think just put it into the bid and let it play out and see what happens. Otherwise, we're value. We we're saying this one should be deduct. That one shouldn't be. I mean, I don't, I don't want to be in that conversation right now. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. So, uh, Paul okay. has made that motion. Deb has seconded. Are we ready to take a vote on Paul's motion? Looks like it. So I will call the vote. Um, Bruce. I support. Paul. Yes. Doug. Yes. Jonathan? Yes. Deb? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Rupert? Yes. Simone? Yes. Angelica? Yes. Alicia? Yes. And um, I'm going to abstain because I'm not sure about the cost. So I'm going to abstain. OK. But the motion carries. So. Okay. Alicia, your question? Yeah, sorry. I just wanted to add a quick comment um, because I do also want to note that I have some concerns about the cost, but I do like, I think it was Bruce, I could be wrong, that recommended that we could just add it for now. And if the cost comes back, something that we're uncomfortable with, we can then decide at that point if we want to move it to um, an alternate. So I hope that we can still consider that in the future. No, that would be off the table, I think, because That's we have to table. give direction here at this meeting to the design team because they're in the final month and a half of completing their documents. So I don't think, I, Rick and Tim, tell me if you disagree. I don't think there's going to be an opportunity to change that direction in the future. It if it's if it's in the documents without being considered as an alternate, we're simply changing the Cape Cod berm to granite. If it's going to be an alternate, either as an add or a deduct alternate, we have to show both conditions. So those have to be in when the drawings go out to bid on the first of July. Okay, John thank you, Jonathan. I, I'm sort of agreeing with with Paul that you know in the in the grand scheme of things this this is still a relatively small uh, item uh, it, you know it's it's not likely to be a, a make or break and and let's not get into kind of ranking our our preferences. Okay, so tile. Does someone want to make a motion about the tile? Maybe Jonathan. I will make a motion that uh, we, well, first we, we hear from the design team, make sure that this won't cause an undue burden on the process, but assuming that it doesn't, um, we include the additional tile in the bathrooms uh, and uh, I think stair was room, was yeah, stair was with room was priority. his priorities. Yeah. A second. Second, okay. Um, Rick and John and Tim, you wanna talk about that? This is a pretty easy one, isn't it, Tim? Uh, this this is the easiest of easies. Um, so <laughs> I mean, I, I I don't want to say you could even wait longer on this one, but if we're being honest about the effort, um, this this is about as easy as it changes there can be, from our point of view. Okay, Rupert. Okay, and so once again, do we have an idea of what kind of amount we're proposing to get added back in? Um, the I wrote them down, Rupert. The the bathroom one, and and the issue is I didn't specify out the hall. The bathroom was in the almost a hundred thousand range. I mean, you Tim, you can check these later, and then. I'm less sure about the wainscoting because I don't didn't see you know the the hallway versus the um the stairwell I I didn't see so yeah the document I will, I will... I'm looking at I see ceramic wall tile in the bathrooms as being ninety about ninety thousand dollars ninety five thousand dollars savings marked up. And there were, I don't see a value for the stairs and the value for the hallways we're not talking about, which was a big number.
we we can certainly go back and do a detailed look at what we think it will be. But I I will say that in the multi fixture toilet rooms right now, we already own full high tile on the wet walls as a durability concern. So these are the additional walls. So we already own more than half of what the chain. So I don't want to say definitively, but I'm fairly certain that this is less than a hundred thousand dollar change. I'm not seeing any hands. Does that mean everybody's ready to take a vote on this? Rupert's hands back up. Hi, Rupert. Sorry about that. Um, Bruce, was it you that uh, identified this stairwell as a separate item, or was it you, Tim? No, you did. You. <laughs> you did. <laughs> you I did. thought the stairwell got mentioned as a separate item from the regular hallways at some point by someone. It's possible that it did, but just looking back at the document um, that summarized all the options, it wasn't called out as an, a separate number, which is why we're having a hard time putting a number on it now. There was an item for hallways and there was a number for deleting wall tile at the multi-fixture toilet rooms on the, on the walls that were not wet walls. To clarify my statement that it would be less than 100,000 was the tile in the toilet rooms and the stair. And I was not considering adding any additional tile in the corridors throughout the building. Right, okay. exactly. Perfect. Do you put them both together, Tim, which is great. Okay. Correct. Okay, so also not seeing any hands. So is the time to take a vote? I think so. Uh, so I'll go around. Uh, Bruce? I support. Paul? Yes. Jonathan? Yes. Doug? Yes. Deb? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Rupert? Yes. Simone? Yes. Angelica? Yes. Alicia? Yes. It's unanimous, unanimous with three absent. So, Kathy, you're a yes. I'm a yes. Oh, Kathy's a yes, yeah. Okay, got it. Great, okay. Well, well done, team. Um, so, just to go back to the agenda, I think we are now at invoices. Oh, we were going to do an update on the site work. I apologize. Rick and Tim, do you want to do that? Uh, sure. The uh, I believe... They're on track to finish the RAM aggregate piers today. And uh, at which time, Keller, the that specialty foundation contractor, will demobilize and uh, uh, Gagliaducci will begin bringing in the preload fill, which is intended to duplicate the weight of the building and will serve to further compress the soil and they anticipate that to be phased to be completed uh, in uh, another month, say mid June. Uh, and they will be then the early site package will be all but completely completed at that point. So ahead of schedule. That's great. Okay, so I think we can turn to invoices. Deb has a comment. Oh. Or... It, it just really a question. How do you duplicate the weight of a building with a film? Fill. Fill. Fill is soil. Oh, it's a whole it. lot of soil. It's a pile of dirt. Yeah, it, <laughs> Thank you. You'll, you'll see uh, an eight foot high plateau out there when they're done. Okay. And and then, then people will have questions like, what the heck is going on out there? So everybody on the, in this group needs to be prepared to explain what the big pile of dirt is doing. So. Oh, and by the way, that big pile of dirt then gets all spread over the rest of the site to bring it to grade during phase one. So the big pile of dirt disappears by the time the uh, building's occupied. All right. Turn it over to Ksenia for invoice review. 
I'll just throw in one more update detail on the pre-qualification process for the general contractors and the file submitters, which is to say that we're just about through the process. We have enough applicants who are going to be qualified in each category, both enough to meet the requirements and enough to have a decent competitive spread. So there's still a couple of details being worked out, but we're just about there with sufficient time. We will, of course, need to re-advertise re the elevator trade. Very rarely, basically never do we get any submissions there. And it's just a process we have to do, uh, go through for pre-qualification. Again, pre-qualification is not bidding. It is identifying the list of contractors, general and sub, who will be permitted a sub in certain categories that will be permitted to submit a bid when the documents come out this summer. All right, now invoices. One second, I'll put up my screen. I'm very incentivized to get through this quickly because um, almost 10 o'clock in conflicts. Okay, so I'll start with perspective as we did last um, month to say that this bar represents the overall project budget and the road ahead <laughs> as a not committed, not subject to being invoiced, is still by far the bulk of it. Um, the green represents what has been invoiced and paid in the past, and that's only 6%. The black bar represents what's being placed for in front of you for approval today in the current invoice package. And that is $694,000, 694, 768. Um, and uh, the yellow represents the unbilled portion of contracts that are already in place and committed. So that is OPM services through the balance of a job through the end of construction, design services through the end of design and through the end of construction for oversight, as well as what's left of the uh, early site package contractors work. Okay, um, this, right, this bar right here again represents the full scope of the, the budget and it shows that the, the blue or is that purple um, is the hard cost, right? Construction with like the actual products that you're getting and the green hashed is the soft costs that are inv invested to the professional services and a little bit more perspective that we didn't see last month, um, although it's issued and updated monthly, is the cash flow. The yellow bar indicates where we are in time today. So this is the April package of invoices, April services that we're paying for. Um, the green bars are monthly spending month for the month to date. So they've clearly gone way, way up you know, in terms of magnitude from where we were before. But this is just to say, and this is where we're going. Uh, the particular shape of this is somewhat of an educated guesstimate um, and will continue to evolve and improve as the project comes online, as the general contractor gets awarded. But basically this is a little perspective on where we are um, financially. The invoice package that's presented to you today has all invoices have been reviewed, negotiated, finalized, and are being recommended. We recommend them to you as the openers project managers for approval. Um, there is uh, one, two, three, four, five companies, um, and within them, Denisco's invoice is broken up into three. Uh, let me see, is that a is that a good enough zoom right there? The total of a package is $694,768.20, uh, 53 of which is for the OPM, as owner um, answer advisory, and represents um, a 2% progression on our billing, bringing us to 24% build and 76% uh, remaining for the rest of the, the project. A lot of that is field oversight money. Uh, Denisco uh, is uh, asking for a 5% progression, bringing them to 63%. The balance of 37 represents finishing the contract documents, overseeing bidding, and then overseeing construction. Gagliarducci is the early site package contractor. 
and their bill is for 12% progression, bringing them to 39% complete. In reality, they are already well ahead of that. They are moving very quickly. So this is a pretty conservative billing. Um, and uh, there's a, a, a small bill for BitDocs Online. That's the online website, the hosting platform for that uh, recently uh, uh, accommodated uh, receiving the pre-qualification submissions and that whole process. And then finally, we have a teeny tiny $200 bill from the third party testing company. You'll see more of them as we go on, but they're out there timely. Uh, they're just strangely behind on their billings. Um, this is the answer invoice for 53,000. I'm going to flip from every page and welcome you to stop me if you have specific questions. Uh, this is the Gagliarducci early site package um, bill for 294,000 with their lien waiver. Uh, Denisco's bill for the design progression Denisco's bill for wetland permitting services, small, less than $1,000. Denisco's bill for asbestos and hazmat professional services, um, 9,588. The bid docs invoice for $4,500. And I think that's it. I must have missed the um, testing and inspection one. But okay. any questions? Not seeing any hands. And uh, Rupert, there's a. I make a motion. We accept as presented. Shane seconds. I will not seeing any hands up. I will put it to a vote. Uh, Bruce. I approve. Paul. Yes. Jonathan. Yes. Doug. Yes. Yes. Jennifer. Yes. Rupert. Yes. Simone. Yes. Angelica. Yes. Alicia. Yes. And Ksenia, I want to thank you for both the format um, and the way you're capturing it. I, I find it very useful to see the future flow as well as what we're paying. Thank you. So I think we're ready for public comment. Yeah, I'm just looking around if there are any other final thoughts. I don't see any. So we are open for public comments. Um, and as you know, it, these are limited to three minutes maximum, and uh, we will be uh, taking the public comment, but not responding to the comments as they occur. So Maria, I have brought you into the room. Hi, thank you, Maria Kapicki, South Amherst. Um, first of all, just, um, I don't, speak as a representative of the people who play softball, but thank you um, for the backstop. Really appreciate that. Um, I, I have a question that perhaps um, you could answer at an, at an upcoming meeting. I'm just kind of curious about how the MSBA reimbursement works in this part of the process. Um, uh, how, you know, or do we, are we getting anything from them? Is that all gonna come? at a later date, or, or I'm, I'm just curious about that, if you could address that at, at some time. Um, oh, I had something else and I can't remember what it is. Uh, that's okay. Um, but uh, thank you, um, This the work of um, our OPM and designers has been it, 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 uh, confidence inspiring. Thank you so much for, for all the excellent work. Thank you, Maria. Uh, Tony, I have brought you into the room. Hi, thanks, Tony Cunningham. Um, so uh, I, 
plus one to Maria's compliments. And it was great to see that the estimates came in under budget. Um, I was curious about the canopies. I thought there was a conversation at the town level about putting ARPA money into expanding the canopies over the parking lot to the north part of the lot in phase two. Is that something that the designers will add to their documents at this point, or is that something that the town would do on its own after the project is complete? Thank you. Thanks, Tony. So we we both comments um, are answerable. So what we can do is um, get answers, Margaret, and we can put them in the minutes of the today's meeting, so we don't prolong the discussion right now. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. So do it. We just we'll just get you more thorough answers. Um, I'm not seeing any other. Uh, hands up i have i have one quick question and if um that um is for me and i can understand it more when we meet again in june but in in the specifications you have something called mock-ups which are allowing us to see various pieces and maybe next time we meet you can tell us a little bit more the function of them i don't need to know that now but uh, Amherst College has some on their site right now about a building they're building, and it is kind of giving people choices of windows and colors and stuff. They set up several. So I saw that there were some mock-ups. So maybe next time we can get a sense of what, the, what those will be and when we can be seeing them. Um, I don't need answers to that now. Uh, I can answer simply now if, if you... Uh, okay. The, the mock-up panels that we specify, uh, as you know, as being part of the, the design review uh, group, we're, we're asking uh, that colors be selected. And the mock-ups are used for workmanship and not color or material selection. The one thing that we do use the mock-ups for, uh, for example, we'll get the specified brick and we'll use a mock-up to select one mortar color over another so that's that's the range of uh of color selection that comes from the mock-up we'll also if the mason uh submits the dreaded or equal brick or something we'll we'll have that brick installed in the mock-up as part of the approval process so that's when uh that's when a, a, a mock-up is used for an approval, but generally it's not for colors. In fact, if we have windows inserted in it, uh, we'll tell them that we don't care what color the window is because our, our import is to get it in the mock-up wall and have it tested by the testing agency. Thank you. Hope that helps. No, that helps. Um... Now I saw a mock-up of something that was being built in another country and it was, you know, a selling point for it. So, so I don't see any other comments. Um, we have a June meeting. It should be on everyone, everyone's calendars and the sustainability. Uh, I think we've already posted sustainability meeting for the 28th and we will be putting information into that packet. Um, and so it has a Zoom number. So I wanna thank everybody. Um, this was, uh, in my opinion, a very productive meeting and I apologize for lengthening it by going back to some decisions we made <laughs> a year and a half ago. Um, but I thought about that last night. So thank you all very much. Um, and I will see you in a month. We're adjourned at whatever time it is. 10.07. 10.07. Thank you.